Hello, my name is Kevin Peters with Expo. Today, I'll be talking about Fast Reporter 3, Setup and Report Generation. So Fast Reporter 3 is near and dear to my heart. Um, back when I was uh, working for a tier one provider, I used to manage a lot of data and generate a lot of reports. Um, now, Fast Reporter 3 is incredibly powerful, so it has a lot of features. We're not gonna go, every as you know, go over every aspect of it. I'm just gonna kind of do a quick uh, setup tutorial, how to process data, how to analyze data and generate a report. Uh, in the future, I'm gonna have additional courses on advanced reporting, on custom reports, on uh, validation, uh, you know, analyzing with markers. There's, there's so much that it does. But today, we're just gonna cover the setup and report generation and kind of my quick workflow. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to Fast Reporter 3 here. So this is Fast Reporter 3. And kind of just, you know, looking at the menu system here, uh, over here in the top part, you see the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the different menu structures uh, with the different tabs and, and the different test types, those types of things. And then here in the center portion of it, uh, what we have here, this section here is where the graph will, will load. So if you have an OTDR trace selected, you'll see the graph here. Um, and then just below that, we have the uh, results area. So when we have the individual file selected, this will populate with the, with the information, the header information, the setup information, you know, what pulse width was used, that type of things. And then lastly, over here in the right, uh, this is where the files are at. So when we load the actual trace files, this is where they'll live. Uh, this, is, this is where they'll live. Um, and then, you know, down here in the bottom right, we have uh, files, measurement, identifiers, and match files. So we can look at those individual traces uh, from different perspectives. And so that's what we have there. So the first thing I want to do when I start up IOLM, or so rather, the first thing I want to do when I start up Fast Reporter 3 is I want to create a project file. A project file is essentially the thresholds and settings and parameters that you want to use to define the reports and the analysis that you're doing. It's, so it's almost like jobs. And so uh, if I have different thresholds for different customers or different organizations, um, I would create individual projects for that. So if I'm doing a job for, you know, Acme Construction, or if I'm doing a job for, you know, um, uh, you know, some generic uh, power company or whatever, then I would create individual project files for those customers or those organizations. So let's jump into it. So the first thing I do is I will go over here to the home file the home tab rather. And then way over in the right, you see where it says settings. I'm gonna go ahead and select settings. And then from here, if I wanna give my project a title, an author, you know, any of that kind of stuff, this is where I would populate, you know, that information. So in here, I can put my name uh, and then I can put uh, my company, you know, whatever customer that is, you know, those types of, uh, you know, those types of information. So this one, I'll call it, you know, Acme Inc. That's who I'm doing the work for. Uh, and the, but under file managing, or file matching rather, is how we can set the file matching. So file matching is incredibly important. This is how we define how the software knows to match individual tests. So if you have an A to B OTDR, B to A OTDR, and an OLTS file, how do we match them so the software knows that these three tests are associated to fiber one, fiber two, fiber three? That's using file matching. And there's different ways to file match. There's auto matching using the identifiers. Uh, and that's this top portion here. And you can match by cable ID and fiber ID. So all the ones that are selected is how it's going to match. So if the cable ID and the fiber ID match, if it's cable two and fiber two, then it'll put those files together. I like to match it just by fiber ID. It's a lot simpler, but your workflow may vary depending on how you set up your jobs. So I'm gonna go ahead and unselect everything except for fiber ID. So I'm gonna leave fiber ID checked. We can also match by file name, and then we can also manually match by dragging two files together uh, and then telling them you're matched, right? And so I'm gonna go ahead and hit apply and hit okay. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to file up here and then down to options, and then I'm gonna set my distance unit. So under display, I can set my distance unit. And so I have it set by kilometers in this particular example. So I'll go ahead and hit okay. Then I will set the individual parameters for the different test types. So if I'm doing OTDR or IOLM or fiber inspection, I can set that up. In this particular demo, I'm just gonna do bi-directional OTDR 
So I'm just going to set up bidirectional OTDR. So I'll select OTDR here, and you notice all of these grayed out icons. These will light up when you have an actual OTDR trace loaded and selected. I want to go all the way over to the right to where it says settings. And then under settings, I have two options. I can use the event calculation and thresholds from the measurement file, meaning Fast Reporter will analyze the data based on the thresholds that were set up in the test set. I don't want to do that because that's fairly inconsistent. I want to control that a little bit better, and I want to use use event calculations and thresholds from the application, and the application being Fast Reporter 3. I'm going to go ahead and select uh, that, and then I'm going to scroll down here. You see the different wavelength options. And the files that I'm loading are going to be 13, 10, 15, 50. So I'll select 13, 10. And then here's where I'll start setting some thresholds. Um, so you'll notice there's different options here. So you have unidirectional information, you have bidirectional information, um, you know, reflection, span loss. So you need to decide which thresholds you're trying to capture. In this example here, I'm just going to capture bidirectional information because I'm going to do a bidirectional report. And so I'm going to turn off my unidirectional splice. I'm going to set my bidirectional splice at a value like 0 0.2. Uh, so whatever the values are with, for your organization, I'll set my bidirectional connector loss at 0 0.5, and I will set my reflection at minus 45. Uh, so these are fairly typical values for, for a lot of organizations. I'll turn off span loss and span length because those will vary depending on the job I'm working. I also like to turn off fiber section attenuation this is the amount of loss per distance, so the amount of loss per kilometer between two splices or two events. Uh, if the splices are only 1,000 feet apart, that number can be skewed a little bit because we don't have enough distance for an average. So I often turn that off so I don't start seeing false fails. Um, I am much more concerned myself with fiber uh, attenuation or, or you know, uh, coefficient across the span, right? Um, now, now, keep in mind, this is it's a very valuable number, so I'm not saying it's not a valuable number, but again, I often turn it off if I'm expecting a lot of events or some events that are very, very close together. So that's just the value that I'm, that I'm wary of. Uh, I'm going to leave span ORL on. I'm going to set it for 28 dB. And again, all these values are going to be set based on, on your parameters. Down here at the bottom, you see we have uh, include span start and include span end. And so I do have a launch cable. So I do want to include the span start. I do not have a receive cable, so I uncheck include span end. And then I go to 1550, and I do something similar under 1550. So whatever the values here, you know, I'll, you know, I'll turn off some of these that I don't want. And 1550 should have a lower value. <clears throat> and so I'm just going to put in some, some data here, uh, unidirectional connect. Uh, so we'll say, and again, these, some of these values might be a little bit tight. They might be a little bit loose for you. Um, but we'll just go ahead and set them. So the point here is to show you where you can set these values. So once you have this all set, once you have your, your matching uh, identified, once you have all your thresholds and parameters set for all your test types, we can go ahead and save the project as a template. So up here in the top left, I'll hit File. I'll go down to Save As, Project as Template, and then I'll give it a name. You know, we'll just call this one, you know, Acme Excuse me, we'll call this one Acme Fiber or whatever, right? So Acme Fiber or Acme Project. We'll just leave it at that. Um, and so anytime I'm doing a job for Acme, I would start up Fast Reporter 3, I would go into File, I'd go into New, Project, and then I'd load that particular project for that customer, right? So in this case right here, I, I already have it loaded, so I'm good to go. Now I can start bringing in my test data. So I'm going to go up here to the top left, from the Home tab, I'm going to select Open. And from here, I'm going to browse to where my traces are at. And I happen to have mine in this particular directory. And I have two ways that I can drop the information in there. I can either highlight all of the traces and hit Open. Or if I have multiple traces from multiple files, then I can just grab the entire folder and just drop it into Fast Reporter 3, which is what I did here. And then that's going to load up all the traces over here to the file tab. So you see this over here to the right. It's all highlighted. You can see all the traces are overlaid here on the top left. And so with all the traces selected, we need to start looking at our data. We need to start looking at our information. So I don't really start processing and fixing any of the, uh, the fiber numbering or any of the identifiers 
until I know the data is valid. I don't want to waste time fixing all the header information. Uh, I like to get in there and validate the data first. And so the first thing I do is I optimize my view over here to the right. And so all of these windows will move, they'll resize. You can grab one and pull it over to another uh, uh, window if you'd like. So I can grab this results one out of here and I can move it around or I can put it back to where it belongs. So that's essentially what we're doing there, right? So with all the traces selected, I can kind of get an idea of what everything looks like down here in the bottom left. And so I want to validate that everything was, was set up correctly. So the first thing I do is I go over here to the summary tab. So down in the bottom right in the summary tab, I'm going to go ahead and select summary. And then this tells me how the tests were set up. So with all of the OTDR traces highlighted, this is what I want to look at. So I just want to check real quick to see if they were using the same pulse width and duration, if they were using widely varying pulse widths, because if one side was using 10 nanoseconds and the other side was using 50 nanoseconds, then we wouldn't be able to do a bidirectional analysis. It's all right if there's two different pulse widths as long as they're not different on the same uh, wavelength. So 1310 here, uh, we could have under pulse width, we could have 100 nanoseconds, semicolon, 50 nanoseconds. What that tells us is 1310 was using 100 nanoseconds, 1550 was using a shorter pulse width, which is fine, as long as the pulse widths are the same for that wavelength. So I just kind of, you know, scroll through this real quick to see how it was set up. Uh, then I go in here, and if I need to adjust the index of refraction, so if it was incorrectly set, uh, or if you want to change it, then you can highlight it and change it. So anything in, in white is editable. Uh, now, these settings are very important. So this is detection thresholds. This is, you know, when the software anal you know, analyzes the data, it uses these thresholds to determine whether or not an event should be uh, identified. For example, under splice loss threshold detection, it's, it's, it's at dot zero two dB, which is what the default value is. What this means that any event loss that has better than dot oh two dB of loss don't show it to me. So that way we're not picking up any noise. It kind of cleans up the trace a little bit. We don't care about seeing any of those. Uh, for, uh, for reflection, any reflection that's better than negative 72, don't show it to me. You know, otherwise, you, again, you start picking up noise, and you'll get a lot of false events. And so, for example, if I were to select one of these traces, you could see up here that I have a couple events up here. One there, there's one there, there's one there. If I were to go in there and change this detection threshold to say 0.5, all of those traces disappear, or all of those events disappear. They're still there. You can visibly see that they're there, right? You can visibly see that they're there. So if I hold down Control and Alt at the same time, it allows me to zoom in th that direction. If I just hold the Control, I can do this. And so you can see there's clearly an event there. Why isn't it marked? It's not marked because we told the software not to show us anything better than 0.5 dB. And so I go in there and I change this back to default, and I hit enter, and then they all come back. So if I go to 100% here, they all come back. So I want to check that first to make sure that nothing's hidden from me. All right, so I'm just checking all the settings there. Um, and then, you know, with, with, with all the traces selected, again, uh, over here to the right, um, I optimize the view. I check everything. It's all looking good. The range, everything's looking good. I look at the OTDR uh, traces themselves, overlaid. You know, I, I want to make sure that they're not, you know, launching too high, that there's not a lot of tall spikes and big drops in there. If there are, that means I'm really going to have to pay attention when I'm doing the analysis. Uh, if I see, uh, you know, what we call a ski slope, and so essentially, if the OTDR trace, you know, if it launches, and it comes up and it does this gradual slope. So, for example, if we had a connector here, and it came down and it did one of these things, and that tells me there's some high reflection. So just you know, visually, I look at it. I want to check them, you know, to see where the end of fiber is. You know, how much, how far away we are from the noise floor. If I see any oversaturated peaks and stuff like that, uh, I'll do a, um, a a video on kind of advanced analysis at some point. But visually, I look at this, and then I select each direction. So I I, I select the first fiber here, and I like a naming convention that sorts alphabet, you know, alphabetically and numerically makes it a lot easier to manage it. Just like when you're saving files on your computer, sometimes you save one as one, two, three, four, single digits, but then we try to organize them, they go one, 11, 12, 13, right? And so in this example here, I got a really good naming convention that sorts quite easily. 
So what I do is I, I highlight the first one, then I hold down the shift button, and then I select the last one, which is 24, and it'll highlight all of one direction. And so again, I, I look at everything here to make sure that it's all the same. So 100 nanoseconds, 10 nanoseconds, everything looks good here. Then I go to the event table. I, I go to the thresholds just to confirm the thresholds are locked in, you know, to whatever values there are. Um, and don't be confused by these thresholds here because these are the thresholds that were uh, that were set up by default within the test set, right? Um, these are not the thresholds. That's why they grayed out. They're not the thresholds that we set. Uh, so I'm gonna go to event table here. And this is where I start looking at my event tables. So I'll, you know, I'll scroll down, you know, check for anything. You see, we have global pass fails here. I can see we have a fail over there we'll have to look for to see what's causing that. So I'll scroll down real quick and kind of look for that. So here we have a failed reflection at the patch panel on fiber number 13, right? It just barely fails. I think we have it set for neg 45, I believe. Um, but but it, it is a fail. So I'm just kind of scrolling across, seeing what I have here. So the very first thing I check is, was a launch cable used? And we can see a launch cable is used here. This means start, start of analysis right here, that, that, uh, that double arrow. And we can see down here as well, if we look at it, this is the launch of my OTDR. This is basically a kilometer of section. And then right here, we have our span start or the end of our launch. And so we see the reflection here. So this is the patch panel. This is the most common failure point. And, and, and it's a little frustrating because when you're looking at the test data, you know, it's, it's really important to stress the importance of fixing this problem while you're in the field because this is, a, this is typically just a, a dirty connector. Could be a damaged connector, but either way, there's something wrong with the connector. And so, you know, I'm looking to see if, uh, if, if my launch cable is properly nulled out. And if you look here, 48 of 48 of these uh, events exist on every single fiber. So at 13.10 and, and, and 15.50, we have that event. Then I'll go to the end to see if it all ends at the same location. And so you'll notice here, the end of fiber, or the end of span is over here, but we still have data over here. So this is caused by some sort of ghosting. So whoever did this trace, one of their traces ghosted pretty badly. So this is a real trace that I borrowed, that I took from a customer, and I just took all the information off of it because I thought it was just a good example. And so in this case here, I have 48 of 48 all the way down. But if, 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 for example, one of these, for whatever reason, was over here, so let's say this is the spanned end, then we would need to fix that, right? We need to move that over. Um, and, and, and I'll show that in the, uh, um, on the B side, on the B side. So, so from this side here, I'm pretty happy with everything I see. Basically, you're just analyzing data. Uh, and again, what you're looking for here is, you know, if you notice this one, one of 48. So only one of these out of the 48 uh, exists here. So if you scroll down, there it is right there. It's a very low loss gainer is what's happening there. Um, so th that's all I'm doing. I'm just going across, checking the, you know, validating the data. So now we need to select our B side. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight the first fiber, shift click the last one, and this will select the next 24 files. So, but if you look here, it's B to A, but we don't have it set for B to A. So the first thing I want to do is I want to right click, go to direction, and then change the direction to B to A. So now we've done that. So now we have B to A selected. And then again, we're going back in here and trying to, you know, uh, check all the results. You see I have more fails on this one. If you look here, the launch cable is not set properly. So we see there's a launch cable that was used, but it shows the launch over here. And that's not what we want. So again, just touch where it says DB, and then right click, and then set a span start. And then that's what it does, sets it as span start. So now we can go in there and look at that. And if we scroll down here, start looking, there we go. So we have some contaminated connectors. And most likely what happened here is we picked up some contamination. You know, in fact, it's, it, we had a really good connection for a while. So we started picking up some contamination and then it carried it with us. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse as they were going down. And so this is a, a clear indication of, of, of a dirty fiber. So uh, it would have been good if they were to fix that in the field. So, so again, that's, that's some of the things that we're looking at here looking at our splice losses, checking all of that. Uh, and again, if you have a receive cable, you can go in there and right click and set as a span to end as well. And so now that we have all this test data looked at and validated, of course we have some fails here, um, but, uh, but for, for demo purposes, that's fine. So now that I have all that set, I wanna make sure that I have all of my 
my identification right. So I'm going to hit control A again to highlight all the files. And then I'm look here and I'm going to look down here on the left and I'm going to look at all the identifiers that were populated. So here's what we got going on. Anytime you see a semicolon, anytime you see a semicolon, like right here, this is an indication that this value uh, company has different values uh, for different traces. So some of the traces say XFO uppercase and some of them say XFO Inc. Um, some of the locations say Goodyear, some of them say Phoenix, some of them aren't even set. And so we have a bit of a mess here. The fiber IDs on one side, they saved it as one, two, three, four. On the other side, they save it as fiber zero one, fiber zero two. You get the idea. So the first thing I do is I clean all of the common data up, all the stuff that is common across all the traces. So what's common across all the traces? Well, job ID. So we can put in here, well, you know what? This was the Acme job. And the customer was Acme Corp. We are Expo Inc. You know, I am the first tester. Uh, my son is the second tester. So as fast as I'm typing here, if you notice, if I, no matter where I click, that is what we're seeing. We made all of those changes there, right? Then I hit Control A again to continue. Um, so for this here, if you notice, we have something here going on differently. I don't want any of the identifiers. I don't want any of these identifiers here um, to be different. So on some of the traces, they put cable ID here. On some of the traces, they put fiber ID. So you get the idea here. We don't want that. We want this all to be in a specific order. And the order that I normally use is I will set this for cable ID. And I will set this for fiber ID. And then this one here is going to be location A. And this one, I set it for location B. This is the way that I do it. This is the way that I do it here. And so, um, so now that we've done that, we, we, you know, we need to start fixing the rest of this information. So go in here, you see that they all have the same A and B location. Sometimes I'll do that if I'm working a project, I'll always make the A side the hub and the B side the remote. If I'm testing hub to hub, then usually it's the, if I'm going counterclockwise, it's the one on the left, that's the A and the one on the right. That's just my workflow. So however you want to define it, in this example, I'm going to set it based on how it was done in the field. And so I'm going to select the A side here. And then I'm going to put in the information. So Goodyear, Arizona, which is where I live. And we're testing to Phoenix. Um, and that's what we're doing there, essentially, right? And so I also want to fix the fiber numbering. And so the fiber numbering, and this one happens to be 1 through 24. And so I have fiber 1, fiber 0, 2, fiber whatever. Because what happens is, if I go down here to the bottom right, this is going to show me which files are already matched. And, if, and remember, we're matching by fiber ID. If I clicked on match files, what we should be seeing is 1 through 24 here. And then for the files, we should see them side by side covering all 24. You'll see what I mean here in a second. Um, some of these other tabs, if you want to look at the individual 13, 10, and 15, 50, that's what measurement does. If you want to look at a specific um, identifier. That's what this does. Uh, and, but right now we're working in files. So I'm going to, again, select the A side with the A side selected. I'm going to right click and go to auto documentation. So we have two ways to auto document. We can auto document by fiber ID or by all identifiers. Right now it's selected for all identifiers. So I can mass change all of this down here if I wanted to. Uh, but in this situation, I just want to do fiber ID and I don't like using the increment, uh, the, the prefix for my fiber ID. Like some people put fiber one, fiber two, fiber three, um, or connector one. I just like a raw value. And so I'll delete fiber. And I want to start at one, but I want to have four incrementation. We're seeing a lot more 17, 28, 864s, larger count fibers. So I've started to go to four digits. So it's going to be four digits starting at fiber number one with no prefix. All I got to do is hit OK. And it fixes all of that. One through 24. The first one's one. And the last one is 24. See that? Then I do the same thing for the other side. So I go to the other side, the B side, highlight all of those. And this one, I got a lot of stuff to fix, right? I got a lot of stuff to fix here. Um, I'll come back to cable ID. But fiber ID, I need to fix. 
And so this side is the B side. And so I'm just gonna put the silly codes here for this side of the link. And then I'm gonna right click, do the auto documentation. And then I'm gonna delete fiber, four digits, hit okay. And it's fixed it here as well, right? And so for cable ID, this is where the fiber ID was before. That's why it has these values here. What I'll do is I'll just control A, and then we'll put in a common cable ID. We'll say this is, this is cable number four. Now we have it set. I'll often use the comments for the relay rack information here. And so I'll often use the, the, the comments for this. Um, and so if you wanted to add shelf information, panel information, you know, whatever, uh, then you can do that. And so I, I've done that there. So now we have everything fixed. We have the direction set. You'll notice something different here. Look at how these traces cross over here. We have something called virtual bidirectional. So under the, uh, th these, um, uh, the options here, you can do virtual bidirectional. So it creates a virtual bidirectional so you don't have to create a BDR file if you don't want. So if I uncheck this, um, they, they go back to the standard flat trace. But if I leave it checked, it creates a virtual bidirectional so I don't have to do a BDR, right? I don't have to do a BDR. Um, you know, and, and so in this case here, if I wanted BDR files, then I would go down and create bidirectional files down here. Uh, during this uh, workflow, I'm not going to. I, I normally don't do that. Um, and so at this point, I can either generate a report or I can, you know, do something different. Um, one thing that I can do uh, for, you know, I can actually um, create or save the files based on the identifiers. I'm not going to in this case because everything's nice and clean. I have nice uh, naming convention. But let's say that my file naming is just a bit chaotic and I want to fix it, the, the, the name of my traces. When you're all done, and you saved it, right? When you're all done and you saved it, because nothing is saved until you hit save here or file, save selected, uh, uh, save selected files. Otherwise, everything else is still in the memory. So nothing has actually been written to the file until you actually save, save the selected files. You can also save selected file as. And what this allows you to do is save it based on the identifiers. So if, if I were to go ahead and check use file documentation, I can actually save it based on these identifiers. And so you see identifier one through five, it's out of order right now because I just used it a minute ago. And so what that is, is this is one through five right here. The top one's one and the bottom one is five. So this is essentially what's happening here, right? And so I want to, I like naming mine A location, B location, cable ID, fiber ID, and maybe even direction or wavelength if, if I'm using SORs, right? So with all the files selected, I'll go to File, Save As, Save Selected Files As, and then in here, you can see how, in fact, I'll set it back to default, the two options that we have. We can either use the original file name or we can use the file documentation to rename. I'll have that checked. And so essentially, we're gonna be able to name it based on the identifiers and the different parameters within the tester. So you see here we have identifier one through five, and essentially one through five is this right here. So this is one through five, with the top one being one, cable ID is one, and then none is five. And so I wanna name it by location A, location B, fiber ID, um, cable ID, direction, and wavelength. Don't forget wavelength. So of course, you know, the rest of them are, you know, are, are, are hit or miss depending on what you need. Wavelength for SOR files is absolutely necessary. If you're just doing standard uh, uh, Expo TRC files, then you wouldn't have to worry about wavelengths because it's one file. But in SORs, they're individual files based on wavelength. It's important to check that. So I'm gonna check that in there as well. Um, and so essentially, if you look at my naming convention, um, I have direction in here. So I'm gonna change it to cable ID, right? So what I'm gonna do is I can resort these because right now it's saving like this. It's kind of this big mess here and there's no separator. So I'm gonna add a separator, an underscore in this example. Then I'm gonna move um, location A to the top. Then I'm gonna move location B just underneath it. So now it's gonna be, if you look at the identifiers now, location A, location B, fiber ID, or cable ID, fiber ID, direction, Wavelength, so it's one big long uh, name. Just make sure you save it somewhere, and then once I hit save, it'll pull it back up in there, 
And then you'll see we've renamed it completely. So now we have a whole new file name that, that, that includes a lot more information. So however you want to do that, this is a nice little step that makes everything a little bit more uh, consistent. And then from here, we're generating a report. Um, and so I've already saved it. I validated my data. Uh, I'm happy with everything. I got all of my matching. So look at the matching now. We have 24 identifiers. And you see side by side, we're matching A to B and B to A to each fiber. So we've done that. Now I can generate a report. So I go to report up here in the top. And then I can generate Excel or PDF. I like doing Excel because it's a lot more powerful. There's a lot more I can do with it with custom reports. And once it's in Excel, I can generate, um, uh, you know, uh, custom reports and I can generate a PDF after. If I want to create an application report, one that is the same on the actual test set itself, that's a unidirectional one. I can, I can create an application report here, that PDF that comes on the test set. Um, in this case, I want to select a report. And there's a lot of different reports in here. So I have a lot of custom ones, uh, but there are the pre-canned reports. So one of the common pre-canned reports might be something like uh, OTDR bidirectional. So you give it a name. I'm just going to leave, leave the name as, uh, you know, 001. I'll save it as an Excel. And then I'll go ahead and hit OK. And it's going to generate this Excel document. So this is one of the pre-canned ones that comes with it. And so once it pulls up, we'll be able to analyze what we see here. And so here you go, see, here's your bi-directional information, your A to B, your B to A. So if you look at the, the individual graphs, so here's bi-directional graph with the bi-directional results. And here's the A to B and B to A. So there's that. Um, and again, like I said, you know, like I said earlier, there's a lot of different reports that we can pull. And so just kind of go through there and look at the pre-canned ones uh, to see what's interesting for you. Uh, Multi-measurements is, is a nice one that I like as well. This one is, is, is primarily bi-directional. Um, so you won't see any reflection. So this is really good for looking at splice loss, uh, in, in a nice clean format. And so you have individual tabs. You got, you know, 24 tabs here. You got 1310 on the left, 1550 on the right. And so you see all the information. Again, you're not going to get reflection because reflection is not bi-directional. Reflection is only in one direction, right? Um, so there's that report. Uh, there's a lot of different ones you can do. You can do individual OTDR reports, cable reports, network record reports. You know, I encourage you to go through all of those. Uh, I like to do custom reports. And so to give you an idea of what my, some of my custom reports might look like, um, let, me, let me pick one here that I'm working on right now. Uh, so essentially what I have here for custom reports, so I can choose something, um, let me see here, like this one here. So this is an OTDR um, bi-directional report. If I had an OLTS, if I was doing uh, testing with an OLTS, like a MAX 945, I can incorporate that as well. So I can select this, I can generate the report as an Excel, and then it'll create a report that's bi-directional. So this is a custom one that I put together. Um, there's some macros in there for renaming and cleaning up formatting, uh, just to kind of show the power of Excel and to actually make it, you know, really uh, um, uh, kind of eye candy-ish, right? So, so, so here's my, my, my first screen here, it's index. So the first thing I do is I hit this macro, and this macro will rename all my tabs, and then it will actually create this table of content. So now I can bounce back and forth between traces easily. Um, and so here's my table of content. Here's my just standard job information, my front panel report. So this just shows me what my panels look like on either side. Here's a panel on the A side. Here's a panel on the Z side. Uh, and, and then I can set you know, th thresholds if I wanted to do some troubleshooting here um, to see what I can do, right? And so I have that report. I have an event loss report, which looks at all the events in one table. And then I have the individual OTDR report. So on the left, you have 1310. On the right, you have 1550. And if you scroll down, it has all the information on there that you need. The event table's on there. Um, and so this is a custom report. One additional thing I've done is uh, uh, I like to, to quickly analyze data. So I have a macro here that will take all the OTDR sheets to the graph. So now if you hold down the control page down, I can scroll over quickly from trace to trace, and I'm just basically looking at it to see if there's any inconsistencies. Uh, I can go to the element table and do the same thing. So here's the element table, control page down, and I'm just scrolling and scrolling to see, you know, what's going on there, right? Um, and then, of course, if I want to save it as a PDF, I can do that. So, so this is what the custom report looks like. And, and again, we can do this for a lot of different applications. In fact, you can reload projects, which is, a, which is a point I didn't bring up. 
So let's say it's Friday afternoon and you're only halfway done. You're only halfway done. Um, but you don't want to keep Fast Reporter 3 running all weekend. What you can do is you can go to File, Save, Save, Save As, Save Project As, and then give it a name. So I can call it, you know, Training Demo, whatever I want to call it, right? And so I can say, you know, Training Demo. Um, and then basically come Monday morning when I come back to work, I would start up Fast Reporter. I would go to File, Open Recent Projects, and open that Training Demo and it'll bring it back to this exact same location where you can continue. Uh, another thing, be careful how many files you load. Fast Reporter loads all the traces into memory. So we're editing 96 files at a time, 144 files at a time. You'll know the limit of your computer. So it's based on the hardware. I can do an 864 bi-directionally, but I have a really beefy computer. Usually I don't like working above 244 at a time. So once I get my workflow down, it's, it's pretty, pretty simple. I can do an 864 in about 20 minutes. Um, and so, so it's really fast reporting and, and to kind of show you some of the value of that, if I were to go in here and, and, and open a recent project, so I have one here for, uh, full fiber characterization. So this is a full fiber characterization. This is OTDR, IOLM, uh, fiber inspection probe, CD, PMD, OLTS, the whole works is in here. I'm not going to use every single one of these traces, um, but I'll, to, to give you an idea of kind of the power of this solution, I'm just going to highlight them all. I'll go to report, uh, select, and then I'll pick a fiber characterization report of some sort, right? So I'll go to my customization here, and then I'll say, you know what? Let's do, let's do custom FC report. So I can open this up. Now, this one I didn't create. Somebody else created this one, and I happened upon it, and it's really, really well done. But to give you an idea, this is a full fiber characterization report for you know, this organization. So essentially they have, if you look at it, um, all of the OLTS information. So the bidirectional loss, the OTDR, CD, PMD information, and OLTS, it's all in here, right? It's all in here. And then they, they even went so far to start creating custom macros. You can start, you know, you can select the fiber type, how many splices there were, how many connectors there were, and it starts doing analysis based on those thresholds. So you get an idea. I mean, there's a lot of really cool things you can do with the custom reporting. Um, but really, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, once you start using Fast Reporter 3, you realize the functionality of it. It does so much more than I showed you. This is really the highlights of the stuff that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I hope you really enjoyed it. So again, my name is Kevin Peeries, and this has been Fast Reporter 3 Setup and Report Generation. Thank you very much.